All right, so welcome to week one of HCDE 521 UX Speaker Series. My name is Beth Kolko, and I'm here with my colleague, uh, Julie Keats, uh, co-hosting the series. And we're really delighted to welcome our first speaker, Jake Knapp. Uh, Jake is uh, a designer, an investor, and a New York Times bestselling author, as well as the inventor of the Design Sprint. I'm really delighted to have an investor joining us. That's one of the things I'm excited about is how the intersection between design and uh, building great companies. So this is pretty exciting. Uh, so early in his career, he helped build products like Microsoft Encarta and Gmail. You might have heard of Gmail uh, and also co-founded Google Meet. Um, I'm sorry that we're using Zoom instead of Google Meet. Zoom is oh, much well. better. So I <laughs> apologize on my account. <laughs> Uh, in the past 10 years, Jake's coached hundreds of teams at places like Slack, Miro, Lego, NASA, MIT, Harvard. Uh, and in 2021, he co-founded Character, which is a venture capital firm, and he helped startups find product market fit using design sprints. Uh, Jake is a UW grad, he says just barely, um, but he is a Husky. He dropped out of the painting program, I guess back in the day, because it was too hard, managed to come back and finished an art degree a few years later. So with that, um, I am going to hand the Zoom over to Jake and welcome and thank you again for joining us in HCDE and sharing your expertise. We're delighted to have you with us. Oh, thanks so much for having me. Thank you for that introduction, Beth. Um, so I, I'm going to give you guys today sort of a, it's sort of my standard presentation about design sprints. So it's kind of, I apologize in advance, it's a little bit of like a sales pitch for this way of, of working and this way of thinking about using design for for product market fit um, and and kind of the a way of getting teams to think like startups, even when they aren't startups and, and a way to get startups to think like startups, because sometimes it's quite difficult to do so. And, um, but, but it also has like a bit of my, my backstory, uh, which I, I heard was okay to talk about here that, that maybe folks would be interested in sort of the, the, the meandering road of a designer. So you'll, you'll hear that too. And anyway, without further ado, I'll kind of jump in. Um, but the, the, generally when I'm talking about the, the sales pitch of design sprints, one of the core things I always come back to is this notion that it's hard to start new things. You know, and if you're doing something new and no one's done it before, or your team's never done it before, both, whatever, like it's, it's difficult. And, and so a lot of, a lot of what I'll talk about is kind of, you can, you can think about ways to, to help teams start big new projects, big new things. Um, and I suppose there's a secondary meaning, which is that it's been awfully hard in my life for me to start doing um, new things too. Um, but but anyway, when thinking about teams, I'm often focused on like this area, this this first moment, which I think is kind of like a crucial, a crucial moment. Um, and obviously lots to be said about the rest of what goes on in that line and after that line. But, um, but I'm really kind of have over the course of my career become really obsessed with, uh, with beginnings. Um, so it, anyway, we'll, we'll start off with kind of a, um, going way back in time to 1988. So this is uh, that, that grid is the space time continuum. So we're traveling backwards in time. And in 1988, this is a, a photo of me for reasons unknown, wearing a Soviet Union sweatshirt in the middle of the Cold War. I'm not really sure what the story was uh, lost to lost to the sands of time. But um, but the important part of that is that I'm using a computer. I would be been using this computer, uh, an Apple uh, to to see, I believe, and. Um, and it, my mom was a teacher and we always had Apple computer at home when I was a kid. And, and this was like a really formative thing for me. I was obsessed with the computer at first kind of playing games on the computer. But then when the Mac came out and we got a Mac, there was this program on the Mac called HyperCard and HyperCard let you build uh, programs. And it was sort of a, a tool that was very visual. You could put buttons and like text fields. And there was a very simple script. You could sort of control the settings on the on the buttons and, and write this very simple sort of plain language code and create applications. It was really amazing. And it's, you know, it's it's kind of like, like the closest thing today would be Scratch. But uh, but I made games as a kid. I was I was sort of taught myself how to program and make games and would do this all the time, test them on my friends. I really loved it, you know, and this experience of building products by myself was very formative for me because I kind of got to see this, the full 
sort of cycle of, of building something and uh, really fell in love with it. Anyway, I, you know, went on through school, high school in 1996, I went to, uh, to college. So I enrolled at the university of Washington. I'm from Washington state uh, and uh, that's where I, where I live now. So, um, so this was kind of quite a natural place for me to go. And, and I went there, but I didn't, I didn't really know what to study. And there was, at least as far as I knew, there was no, nothing like the, you know, human computer design interaction. It wasn't, it wasn't a program like that at that time. So I didn't, didn't really see a place for me, but I'd always enjoyed drawing and I, you know, I thought I was pretty good at it. So I decided to, to major in, in art and uh, specifically in painting. And I spent several years doing sort of the, you know, this is a, a BFA program. So it's, it's a five-year program and you had to do, before you even started painting, you had to do a lot of foundational art classes. And a lot of those were drawing classes, you know? And, and so as I was kind of thinking about what I might major in, this sounded really appealing. You know, it's a be, be like an artist, you know, it felt really, felt really like a soulful thing to do. And, you know, there were going to be nude models. And I thought that sounded very, you know, I don't know, European or something. It turned out in reality to just be kind of weird, but there was the, the, the sort of scene in those drawing classes, you know, and whether it was a still life or a model or whatever, we were all the students are kind of around in the room and we've all got an easel and a, you know, a big like newsprint drawing pad and a piece of charcoal and you're sketching, you're trying to draw, you know, what you see. And, uh, when we, you know, we do this day after day after day. And as you're drawing, you know, the instructor's kind of walking around and, and, you know, she or he would kind of come up next to you and say like, ah, oh, Hey, you know, you, you screwed up that line or something, you know, maybe kind of mark it up and by and by, you know, as, as you kind of continue to get feedback, you kind of start to anticipate what the, what the professor might say before they came by. And, and so that was, you know, one way of getting better, but there's other way of getting better was, was the critique. So at the end of each, you know, sketch session, we'd all put our sketches up on the wall or we'd walk around and look at one another's sketches and all of your, your, you know, classmates would be, they'd be critiquing me or I'd be joining and critiquing them and saying like, ah, oh, you know, I really like how you did this. Or I, you know, I, I think you screwed up this part right here. This could use that. And it was constructive criticism. You know, I mean, we, I, I, I think like, uh, we were for the most part, like pretty, pretty friendly and collegial with one another. And, and it was a, it was a good process. And anyway, Apart from that, I didn't learn a whole lot in art school and I, and I struggled. Once we got to oil painting, it turned out that I, you know, I looked around the room at the other oil paintings when we would do this critique. And I thought, man, these, these folks, they're going to be artists like with a capital A and I have nothing to say. And I really can't make these oil paints, make anything look like anything. And so I, I lost heart and I, uh, I, I temporarily kind of dropped out. And I, anyway, in, in 1998, I got this job working uh, as sort of an intern at Oakley, you know, the sunglasses company in Southern California. And uh, I, my, my job there, I, I originally thought I was going to be helping to write uh, copy for ads, but they, it turns out they needed somebody right when I got there, they need somebody who knew how to make animated GIFs. And I knew how to do that. And so I was like, I can help with making some animated GIFs today. Sure. And so I ended up getting put into the design department and working on making banner ads. Now you guys are probably all too young to remember this, but back in 1998, before Google, the, everybody would use Yahoo and you'd go to Yahoo and you'd go to different, like click through to different, you know, like topics. And if you got to the sunglasses topic or like whatever sport they were for, you know, the surfing topic, there might be a banner ad, a big animated GIF on the top. And anyway, this is like a, this is like a big way that sort of the web started out. And, and my job was just making animated GIFs. And so I would make, you know, I might make 10 or a dozen animated GIFs, variations, trying to come up with something cool. Cause Oakley has this kind of, you know, you guys know how Oakley is kind of this, like, this like sort of, they go for the sort of Blade Runner kind of aesthetic. Um, maybe that's being generous, but the, the head of design, this guy who would uh, a couple of years later go on to be the CEO of the company. So he was high up in the company. He would come around to my desk, you know, and I'm like 20 years old. I don't really know what I'm doing. I have all the gifts up there and he'd say, okay, let's, let's see what you got. And he would kind of lean down next to my desk like this. And then he, uh, he I knocked over my microphone. He put up his, uh, his arm and he'd push up the sleeve on his, on his shirt, you know, kind of like this. And he put this arm like right by my head and he'd say, okay, go through the gifts. And then if the hair on my arm stands up, that's a, we'll use that one. 
And so I'd click through and he'd be like, nope, nope. And then, you know, every now and then he'd be like, oh yeah, that's, that's it. And, uh, it was, it was kind of, you know, it was kind of weird, but the, the cool thing about it over time was I started to figure out what makes the hair on his arm stand up. Like, what is it? And it was, you know, there was, you kind of get this intuition about it. And, uh, anyway, I, I, I worked there for, for a while, uh, as kind of a side job, I came back and was kind of chipping away at a, at a different degree at the UW in 2000, I left school again, and this time to, uh, to start working at Microsoft. And, you know, I'd, I'd done some design work now at Oakley, and I kind of had a little bit of a portfolio. This is a long time ago. Microsoft logo looked like this at the time. And I worked on this product called the Encarta Encyclopedia. And uh, again, you guys are probably too young to remember, but the Encarta Encyclopedia was an encyclopedia on uh, CD-ROMs. So you'd get a box, it'd have CD-ROMs in it. You'd have a CD-ROM slot in your computer. You want to look up an article. You'd have to put the right CD-ROM in the slot. You know, it's it's wild. I know today to think of this, but this is the way we you know sold software back at that time, and it was it was actually a really cool product. Anyway, the the team had been building the Encarta Encyclopedia since like the early '90s, long before I got there, and it was a well-oiled machine. So I got there, and they just every year they had to they had to have a a box, you know, the new version of Microsoft Encarta on shelves in stores in the, in the late summer in time for back to school. Cause that's when parents would buy the new version for their kids. And so every year we had to like come up with the plan and just like clockwork, like launch it at the same time every year. And you, you knew you had to ship it off because it had to be manufactured. You had to send the, the master disc off in time to manufacture it. So we'd come up with the plan. We'd, you know, spec it out. The engineers would code it, test it, you know, fix all the bugs we were going to get to fix, ship it. And if you zoomed out, you'd see that, Year after year after year, same thing, same thing, just clockwork boom. They, they were they were just this well-oiled machine. Anyway, in 2001, so not too long after I got there, this email goes around and it's like, hey, check out this website. This is kind of interesting. So you click the link and this is what you see. And you're like, oh, that's, you know, we thought that's kind of cute. Oh, look at anybody can write their own, you know, article. That's great. And look at their, that's adorable. They couldn't even get the name of their their website above the fold. But, um, you know, we didn't think too much about it. It It's just kind of an interesting idea. And time went by. And then in 2003, you know, a couple of years later, Wikipedia started to look a lot different. It had by this time more articles than the Encarta Encyclopedia. And increasingly, people were, as they do today, they were going to Google running searches. And just as is the case today, if you run a search almost always there was a Wikipedia article right at the top of those search results. It was fast and free. And, uh, and so we finally realized, well, gosh, this is a little bit of a problem. And so we tried to figure out what we're going to do. And, and so, you know, we got together in a room and we all brainstormed and came up with a bunch of ideas and we argued and argued and argued. And anyway, we ended up settling on this, on, on an approach and, and, you know, we're going to make kind of double down on the, the CD-ROM encyclopedia, make it better than ever. And, and, you know, the, there were, there were some other ideas, like maybe we should give our encyclopedia away for free and compete, you know, and kind of help Microsoft search, but that was too risky, kind of deemed too risky. So we build and launch the sort of better version of the CD-ROM encyclopedia. And we continue with that strategy for the next couple of years. And meanwhile, like this kind of happens and, uh, Anyway, yeah, I don't probably have to explain this to you too much. If you wanted to go today and search on Google for Encarta, you'll find that the first result is on Wikipedia and it says Microsoft Encarta was a digital multimedia encyclopedia because it doesn't exist anymore. It died, which is uh, you know, very sad, but um, but but part of my part of my uh, part of my story and part of part of the learnings that shaped who I am today. So 2005, I'm all bummed out. This is before uh, Encarta had totally died, but you kind of see the writing on the wall. I'd been there for a while, and I went to go work on another project at Microsoft. And this was another idea. This was for something brand new, and this was really exciting. The first time I'd worked at a big company on a team that you know where it was it was really clear like we were doing something totally new. And the idea was a touchscreen device with an app store. So Microsoft at this time had developed this multi-touch technology. They had it on a thing called the play table, which was crazy. It was like this big table, like literally a table that you'd sit around and it had a screen like projecting up onto the surface of the table, but you could touch the screen and you could like pinch and zoom, which if you'd never seen that before, it was wild to see that. It was just like amazing to interact with this. Well, we realized like, hey, we maybe we could put this in like a, tablet or some kind of a touchscreen device. And we also realized 
the future is not delivering software and CD-ROMs. The future is going to be delivering software over the internet. So maybe we have all of this software. What if we delivered it over the internet and we kind of packaged all this together? It seemed like a really compelling idea. So we talked about this idea and we sort of started to argue about like, what will customers say about what, what sort of form should it take? And we start to argue about like how we should build it and sort of like trying to pitch it and, and trying to get in the room with the right executives and trying to line up executives to agree with vision anyway. After a year and a half of arguments and, and flailing, this, this project got killed, which really sucked uh, and, and actually sucked even more when the iPhone came out. And I don't mean to suggest that we were like about to build the iPhone, but like one year later when they so nailed it, it was just, it really sucked. Anyway, um, I learned at this point that having a great idea does not uh, necessarily mean that you're going to have great execution. So with our touchscreen, we had a great idea but we were not able to execute on it. And I'd also learned that having great execution on something like uh, like Microsoft and Carta, we executed really well, but that didn't necessarily mean we were gonna be able to have product market fit, or if we had it, that we were gonna be able to necessarily maintain it. I was frustrated with how things had gone over the last, my last couple of years at Microsoft. I thought, God, there's gotta be a better way to build products. So in 2006, in kind of a huff, I quit my job at Microsoft. And in 2007, I went to go work at uh, Google. Only it's a long time ago, so their logo looked like that. And um, and yeah, so I'm kind of a trader. I went to go work at Google, the company who kind of killed us. But um, I, I went to there and, and I was really excited to learn how Google worked because from the outside at least, and at least at that time, the reputation Google had in that that era was that although they were sort of a, a growing company, that they still moved really fast and acted like a startup. And I just couldn't wait to see what this was like on the inside. And and so we'd start working on, on Gmail and, and sure enough, we'd talk about, you know, this new, whatever new feature, new project we were working on. And people would say, look, like we're we're going to build this thing. We'll get it done in you know two months or something. We're going to let's, let's just crank this out, launch it as fast as we can. And it just felt like this really high speed environment. Um, although, despite the fact that we talked that way, it seemed like everything took at least a year to build, uh, which I've found to be kind of true in every place that I've gone. That that no matter how long we think it's going to take, it usually, if it's ambitious, takes a year or more. Even those things that are supposed to be really fast. Anyway, there was a, a kind of project at Google, apart from those main projects, um, <clears throat> called 20% projects. There's this notion of 20% time. And I don't know if this is still the case at Google, but when, when I was there, they, they encouraged you to spend 20% of your time on whatever you'd like. So if you want to spend 20% of your time working on another team's project, go for it. You know, if you want to spend 20% of your time starting up some new project, go for it. And, you, you know, as long as you spend 100% of your time on your main project, if you want to come up with 20% more time to work for Google, like they were, they were sort of happy to have you do that. Anyway, this was a, a cool a uh, sort of framework I found and and something that that I I did a lot of. I had a lot of 20% projects did not probably all add up to uh, to 100% and probably came at the cost of, of my main projects. But at any rate, I had many. This one I want to talk to you about, I started in 2007 and um, we had this idea, me and a, a couple of other Googlers for basically taking some video tech that we had and turning it into multi-way video calls in the web browser. So we thought, you know, at that time there was there was Skype, you know, there was sort of like a, a very rudimentary version of video chat available just if you had Apple computers, but it was, was a bit it was a bit sketchy, didn't work all the time. It's very hard to get a good multi-way video call unless you had special hardware and like a special service. So at Google, we use a system called Tanberg. We had these special devices in every room, with these big expensive cameras, and we Google paid by the minute for these calls. There were Google offices all over the world. So we spent a lot of money on video conferencing. And we thought like, this is a great thing for us to be able to do video conferencing, but it could be easier and we could make this accessible to a lot more people. So um, anyway, we had this idea. We thought it was a good idea. We thought, hey, all we need to do, we'll call this thing Google Meeting. All we need to do is like sort of put together a good plan for what this should look like. And it seems obvious. Seems like we should just, we should build it. So we started talking about in 2007, 2008, 2009, and we're kind of arguing about like what shape it should take, what the design should look like. We're arguing with executives, trying to figure out what the strategy is going to be. You know, at this time, Eric Schmidt's the CEO, but Larry Page and Sergey Brin are still involved. So there's like three people and you'd hear like a different thing from each one of them. And it was 
I realized though, at a certain point, I was like, oh my God, I've seen this movie before and this does not have a good ending. So in January of 2009, I went to Stockholm to go and visit with the other two guys I was working with. They were based in the Stockholm office. And um, I don't know if you've ever been to Stockholm in January, but this is a photo of it. Uh, it's actually, it's a joke. It's just a blank slide. It's really dark in Stockholm in January. It's a lovely city, but in January, you have no reason really to want to go outside. So we kind of hold up in a conference room and we said, look, I'm only here for a week. Let's just, let's clear our calendars of all meetings and let's focus on this project, let's try to come up with a prototype. Let's try to build a prototype this week. Stop arguing about the perfect thing and just make something we can put in people's hands. And we thought our our colleagues at Google are actually great target customers for this. Let's build something that they can use. And then we won't have to convince people. They'll just see that it's so good. So we came up with what we thought was like a good enough design, like big video at the top and small video at the bottom. And we thought about like, what's sort of the core thing that this has to do. And we thought the core thing is it has to have a link. It's really important that it works with just a link. You send a link by email or chat. Somebody can click the link there in the meeting. And then Michael, this guy, he built a prototype that worked. So this is a this is a screenshot from our first ever meeting using this prototype. You can see a historical photo of me there with no beard. And Michael, the engineer in the big picture there. And it's kind of a hack. So it's like one-on-one -on -one video chat. Whoever was speaking would go into the big feed, but all the other participants in this first prototype just appears thumbnails below. The really kind of key part is down in the corner. It says invite others, HTTP, go slash meet slash rainbow ponies. And this actually worked. If you were in the intranet at Google and you typed go slash meet slash like whatever, rainbow ponies was like the first meeting room, but like whatever you typed would create an instance, it would create a meeting room. Anybody else who typed that URL, they would, they would just join the meeting. And anyway, we shared this with our sort of main project was Gmail. We shared it with our colleagues on Gmail. They started using it and and uh, and it started to spread around the company. Anyway, eventually this thing launched as uh, Google Hangouts at first, which was not what we'd had in mind. Um, and finally, it's today, it's, it's Google Meet. But I had stopped working on this project long before that happened. Um, at any rate, the thing that I thought was so cool about this was actually that We'd gone from this state, which I had experienced firsthand a couple of times and had seen many teams go through, many teams who had great ideas go through this and flail and like go nowhere. And then when we hit the reset button and we built a prototype, then you know, tested it with with our colleagues. So it kind of proved out that there was that there was demand for this thing. Then everything was different. Once that happened, we had momentum, you know, the project was, there was clarity about what to do. We were confident that we were doing the right thing. Everything felt different and was different after that moment. And I started to think about that first moment of a project, that first part when you're starting out. And I thought, you know, you know, I've been working at Microsoft and Google. These are companies that know how to execute. They know how to get things done. They do things a little bit differently at each place. Their strengths and weaknesses, sure. But like, they know how to get things done. And yet at neither place did they have a recipe or a formula or an approach for what to do at the beginning. It was chaos in both places as you tried to, you know, somebody would try to assert that they had the loudest voice or if we did try to do something, it was like, well, we'll get together for a day and brainstorm, you know, shouting out ideas and sticky notes. So there was no structure and it felt like there was a huge opportunity here. So in 2010, I started, you know, sort of a new 20% project. I, I had up till that point in my career been designing products. And I thought, you know, maybe I could apply some of that same thinking to designing time. And, and sort of what I mean by designing time is that most of our time at, at work is not designed. You know, it's not, it's not very intentionally structured. It, it, there's some intention, but it's, it's, it's almost more organic and not organic in a good way, but more organic, like pond scum taking over a pond. Here's what I mean. So if you, if you looked at like my calendar, when I first started working at Google, let's say, you know, be clear, right? Cause I'm a new employee. I have no, no meetings on the calendar and I'm really excited. Rest of my first day. I'm like, Oh, great. You know, inside Google, what's going to happen. We're going to build, this is going to be so cool and exciting. 
And I was really excited. And I started to meet people and it's like, okay, uh, oh, great. Here's Bob. Here's, you know, one of my teammates. Maybe we can meet later in the week and kind of catch up and kind of show me the ropes a little bit. And, oh, my boss can fit me in for a lunch, you know, this Wednesday. Awesome. And, you know, oh, now I'm on a project. And uh, so that's good. I've got a project. So I've got a few things associated with that. I kind of feel like I'm getting a little bit in the flow. And then now I'm on a second project. So cool. I'm kind of being fully utilized and that's going to add a few more things. But then at some point it's like, oh, there's so much stuff I got to kind of color code. So I know which building to be in and try to find a slot on there where I can sit at my desk and eat lunch, you know, check my email. And, and then, you know, at a certain point, it's like, I could not remember what I was so motivated and excited about when I started working there, because I'm just constantly bouncing off of things, just bounce, like bouncing context, switch, context, switch, context, switch, email, email, chat, chat, ping, ping, ping. And it stopped being about the work or the mission, or, you know, even the project that I'm on, it's like very hard to gather together and do my best work or for a team to do our best work. It felt a lot more like I just, I've just got to survive. Like I just have to try to get across the, the road without getting hit by a, a truck. And this thing that happens is something that I'll refer to as the defaults, like the defaults of work. Like we all want to do the, you know, right by our colleagues. We want to be helpful. So we say yes to meetings. We reply to emails and chats as fast as we can. And we end up subdividing our time and our energy and our focus into lots of tiny little pieces. And in doing so, we're, we're filling up the calendar. Like we're, we're making sort of you know, use of all that time, it's all being utilized in some way, but not in often the most effective way. And uh, what I thought was maybe there's a way to redesign that to create a situation where we're able to get kind of what happened in Stockholm, where like it's dark out and we're in the room and we're all focused on this one thing and we only have a week, then we can do an amazing thing if we if, if we're sort of in that mode, but creating that mode in a normal sort of work setting is just like impossible. So how could you get there? So I, in 2010, I started a new 20% project. I called it the design sprint. And my idea was to figure out what would be the best way to start a big project. I figured the most time I could get from a team would be a week. I thought that'd be hard, but I think I could do it. And I thought the perfect start to a project, you, you kind of need momentum. And I thought momentum you know, in, like in physics, momentum is a real thing. And if I say momentum and I'm talking about people or a team, I mean, it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of hand wavy, but I think that's like a real thing. Like if you've been working on something that had momentum or you felt like you had momentum with your own personal work, you know what I'm talking about. It's different from when you don't have momentum. And, and one way to maybe define it is to say, you know, you've got clarity about what you're doing and you, you're committed to doing that thing. And, and if it's a team of people, maybe they don't all agree, but they're committed. We're going to do this. This this is the way we're going to do it. And yeah, okay, we're going to do it. We're going to get it done like this. And you've got some confidence that like, if if we do this thing, like there's a there's some kind of pot of gold at the end of that rainbow. Like if we do this thing, people will care about it. That's the most fundamental thing. If you're building a product or a service, will people care in the end if we do this? Will it matter, right? And so so if you could somehow get those things at the beginning, I thought that's that's a game changer for the project. Anyway, in 2010, I ran the, the first ever design sprint at Google, and it didn't look very much like the way a design sprint looks now, but I ran the first one. And over the next couple of years, this became my full-time job at Google, running design sprints for teams, going from the Google search team to Google Chrome to Google ads to Google X, and you know, kind of tweaking the process as I went. But basically, the fundamental idea was we build a prototype in a week, get a team together, focus for a week, build a prototype. And then in 2012, I left Google and went to go work at Google Ventures. So this is a, a separate company, uh, another one of the Alphabet companies. And we were investing in startups. And the idea was to use design sprints with, with startups. So this was really cool for me, an opportunity to get to work with startups to see inside this moment when teams have a lot more clarity, a lot less complication because things are very early and they have a different way of looking at things. Um, so you guys are probably familiar with this kind of diagram or some variation of it. The idea is if you're a startup, you can't afford to just go and go and go and go and go and then launch this thing when you get it perfect. You don't have the money and the existing audience and et cetera that a big company has. You've got to as quickly as you can test your idea and get some data about it and find out if you're going in the right direction. And the idea with that loop is that, well, if you're not, then you kind of can, you can pivot. You can maybe adjust things either a little or a lot to try to find product market fit, to try to get to that point where customers care about the thing. They're, they're paying money for the thing. They're giving you time for the thing. They're using the thing. They want the thing. 
so the way that the teams that that I've started working with were doing this, and it's a really smart philosophy, was building and launching a minimum viable product. They would build and launch the minimal thing they could as fast as they could to try to get that data and try to understand, are we on the right track yet? Because otherwise, if, if we don't get there as fast as we can, we'll run out of money or somebody else will take the opportunity. We've got to get there. You know, it's a matter of survival. And like I said, this is a smart philosophy. The challenge they were having is, Teams would say, yeah, we're going to launch, you know, in the next few weeks, maybe next month. And it would, it'd be, you know, it would be a year. Everything seems to take a year because these were ambitious projects and ambitious projects take a long time. And so the problem is, while this is a very smart philosophy, what's really happening is in pursuit of this data that would allow us to act really smartly and informed and scientifically, in pursuit of that data, we're following a hunch. We're following our intuition for a really long time, but we haven't really tested our intuition yet. So the notion with the design sprint became, how can we help these founders to test their hunch, their intuition as quickly as possible? Can we do it in a week? Uh, we couldn't really give them the same kind of data that you can get from a launch. You can't get the same people spending real money, people using their real time. That's not possible to really do in, in a week if you've got an ambitious, complex project. But what we could do with a prototype is to put it in front of customers, watch how they react, let the team see themselves see a prototype in a week, and basically create a simulation of what a launch might look like. And a simulation, it turns out, is, is a lot better for improving your hunch, your intuition, than, than nothing, which is the alternative. Um, but it's actually pretty good. It's a pretty good way to, to test things out. So over the next few years at Google Ventures, because we we're investing in a lot of companies, I had the opportunity to run 20, 25, 30 design sprints a year until the point I run about 150 of them. And all along, kind of tweaking the process, working with my colleagues at Google Ventures, figuring out like, what is the best way to sort of shape these days and structure them? And as you can see my notebook from the time, and it all kind of comes back to something that's related to me being a kid using a computer, because if you have ever written code, um, and I learned this only very recently, that the best way to think about what kids or people learn when they, if you know, learn how to write code, if writing code does not become your career, this really powerful thing that you're learning is that, you know, this notion of like, first this happens, then this, then this, then this, if this, then this, it's procedural thinking. And what I started to do was to apply procedural thinking to the way a group of humans works together over the course of a week and try to figure out if for the outcome that we want and all of the little sub outcomes that we need along the way. What is the code that gets us there? What is the sequence that gets us there? And it became this checklist of activities. And um, anyway, I've talked a lot in the abstract about a design sprint. Let me really quickly, I'll give you the, the little quick pitch, the quick explanation of what a design sprint is and how it's different from the way teams usually work. Um, the notion, as I've, as I've sort of said, ran into the ground is that it's the start of a big project. So that's important. Teams starting a big project, you get a team of people who have different skill sets. And this team is like four to seven people. So it's not a huge team, but you have enough people that you have different perspectives in the room and you get a week of time. And really it's best to think of it as two to three consecutive sprints, but at its core element, it's one week of time, clear the calendar for that week. And then instead of those defaults that I talked about, so no other meetings, email, autoresponder goes on, you know, we're not on Slack. Instead of those defaults, we're following the checklist. And um, this checklist is really long. Like it's in the back of my book sprint and it's, it's like 14 pages long. I won't bore you with all of the details, but there's a focal point for each day. And those, those focal points I think are a helpful way to understand what goes on in the sprint. So the focal point for Monday is making a map. And um, the, the idea with the map is, that by default, often in my experience and teams I've seen, it's often overwhelming when working on a complex project at the beginning, trying to figure out how everything is going to fit and come up with a perfect plan for all of it. It can be paralyzing, or at the very least, it could take a really, really long time to get action. And it's vulnerable to people who have the loudest voice or want to sort of argue for their way. In a sprint, we're going to focus on just one key moment of our destination and prototype and test that one key moment. So the map is sort of a simplified version of what it might look like. You've got customers and key actors on one side. You've got this kind of flow. Now, this isn't exactly like a customer journey, which is usually very detailed and kind of click by click. This is kind of zoomed out. It's like, what are the key components of the system? And we use this to figure out, okay, who's the most important customer and what's the most important moment on that map? We're going to recruit three to five of those customers. 
for Friday. They're going to show up on Friday. And then we're going to create a prototype. The rest of the week, we're going to spend creating a prototype of that key moment. And along the way, we've got some key risks we're trying to assess, some key hypotheses we want to test. We're going to test those with our prototype. So what we've done now is by saying like, we're bringing customers in, we're scheduling them, we're going to have interviews with them on Friday. We, we're we not prepared for those on Monday. We, we need a prototype. We need something to show them. Um, we created this really great deadline. And deadlines are super powerful for galvanizing people, getting everyone to focus, getting a lot done. So this is sort of part of the magic of the, of the sprint. Um, on, on Tuesday, we sketch solutions. So by default, most teams, when they need to do something together, they'll do what we did on Encarta and what I've seen many teams do. And it's to get in the room and, and kind of shout out ideas in a group brainstorm. So you know how this works. Like somebody says an idea, somebody else has an idea, somebody gives sort of a sales pitch for their idea. Once a sales pitch has been introduced, everybody's got to give a sales pitch. It's like an arms race. And some people are really comfortable in this environment. They're great at extemporaneously, like coming up with a sales pitch for their idea on the spur of the moment and coming up with ideas off the spur of the moment. And, and maybe they even have a reputation for coming up with ideas on the team. Some people do not thrive so much in this environment. And there's all kinds of reasons why somebody might not, you know, um, they, they may feel that they, there's a bias against them for whatever reason on the team. And, you know, they might be right. There's all kinds of cognitive biases that we have, uh, conscious and, and ones that we're not aware of. They, they may feel like, um, you know, I just can't really think in this environment. I put myself in this category. I have a really hard time thinking when other people are talking. As soon as somebody says something, that's the reset button on my brain. There's nothing new coming out of me. And, you know, maybe someone's just more introverted, whatever, new to the team. But there are a lot of reasons why some people don't participate as much or their contributions aren't as strong that don't necessarily have to do with their capacity to come up with good solutions. And some people participate way too much. You know, they're just oh, boom, boom, boom. They've got tons of stuff. And it can be frustrating. And I found myself being quite frustrated in these sorts of settings. Now, what I've seen historically on teams is that where the solutions come from, it's not from these group brainstorms. The solutions come from one person working on their own. And uh, I, I saw there was actually a period of time before I started doing design sprints when I was trying to run group brainstorms at Google. And people love doing it, it's really fun. What I found out is when I came back, those ideas never went anywhere. The ideas would come from an individual who maybe on, on their own, maybe taking a walk or you know waiting in line for a coffee or sitting at their desk, they have an idea. And they have time to think. And that idea develops into a solution. And then this person, you know, uses their superpowers and maybe it's, you know, if it's a designer, maybe she mocks it up. If it's an engineer, maybe they build a prototype. If it's a, you know, marketer, a product manager, maybe they're writing a spec or putting together a presentation in some way, put a lot of detail behind the solution and then come back to the team who's maybe got some thin ideas from a group brainstorm and says, hey, here's what I think we should do. And everybody else is like, yeah we should do her thing. That is way smarter. That is way more thought through than what we were going to do. Yeah, we'll do that. So it's sort of this lone genius approach. And it's great because you get this well thought through approach. But what kind of sucks about this is we have one possible path now. We don't have, in my crappy drawing, there's four people, but we only have one path. We don't have like a path from the other three people that's on the same playing field. So in a design sprint, what I wanted to do is create a situation where people instead of group brainstorming, we would get the essence of that lone genius, but we'd set up a situation where every single person had the chance to quietly and take their time, put together a proposal. So we have, uh, we have options and we do that with sketching. So every person sketches in the same room, working in silence. And, uh, you know, this is something that I was doing in the, in the basement of the art building at the UW that kind of came back to me as like, this is, this is kind of powerful. You get people working together for an hour, two hours, Ideas will come, solutions will come, and uh, and we'll put them down. We'll make them anonymous, and we'll get those ideas brewing. They'll turn into solutions. We'll be able to put them on paper, and once they're on paper, then we can evaluate them in a much more sophisticated way than we can when we're shouting out sales pitches for ideas. So these solutions have a lot of detail, and we've got a healthy competition. On Wednesday, the design sprint, we've got to decide. So instead of sort of an endless debate, uh, we we're fast and decisive, and we do that by sort of reviewing the sketches in silence. And again, this is sort of procedural thinking. What do we need to get to? We need to label the key ideas. We go through and do that. 
And then we do sort of formal arguments. But again, a lot of this work happens in silence. And finally, the decider makes a call. One of the key elements of the design sprint is one person is identified as the decider. And this is something that in looking back on my career, it was actually really helpful to have the guy come sit next to my desk who made all the decisions and put his arm next to my head. If it's really creepy, I don't think that's the best way you should do it, but I'd like to see if the hair on his arm stood up because the decider is often not involved at the beginning of the process. They're not involved in the decision really can most effectively shape how people use their time and the direction the team makes. It's usually this high stakes meeting that happens much later. So instead we involve the decider in the very beginning, we get them to make the call right away about which things we should test when there's still room to find out if they're right or wrong. On Thursday, we prototype. So we've got a solution or maybe two or three solutions to prototype. And instead of building that minimum viable product, it was still a smart philosophy, still a good idea to do that later. We're going to create a simulation in a day. So something realistic looking, that's just sort of a facade. And this might be a website, it might be an app, it might be marketing for something, it might be um, you know, a sales deck, whatever we've identified as the crucial moment. Maybe it's a, a physical object of some kind. It might even be a service, the way people interact, but whatever we've identified as sort of the crucial moment, we can prototype that in, in a day and, um, and then test it with customers. And then we test it, right? So on Friday, instead of guessing how customers will react, the source of a lot of arguments, source of a lot of those loops in that diagram that was not good for how we were um, building those, those projects that, that were going nowhere, we get to watch customers react right away and, um, and, and see. And this we're basically using like a one-on-one -on -one interview, what is typically like a usability test. And instead, we're saying we're going to use that kind of interview and we're going to tune it so it's about product market fit and trying to assess our intuition about whether customers want this thing, whether it's a fit, whether this is the thing we should invest our time in building. And we do up to five of these in one day. And meanwhile, the team's watching, taking notes and looking for the answers to key questions. So we've got sort of these key questions about product market fit, these key questions, these key hypotheses or risks that we've identified earlier in the week, some of the other design sprint steps that I haven't gone into detail about. And we come up with an answer for each customer as it sort of thumbs up or thumbs down for each of these questions. And then at the end, those sort of bigger checks and Xs are the pattern. What did we conclude? And this is quite common that after the first sprint, you see a mix, some green and a lot of red, You know, a lot of things that we, we haven't solved yet. Here's the same team with sprint two. And you can see that most things at this point have flipped to green, especially if you look in that far column, you go from yellow to like three greens, to everything green except for one. And this is a team then who has confidence that this is what they should build. They've, they're have they on the right track. So this notion of like clarity and commitment, we all saw how it happened. Even if we didn't agree with the solution, we've seen it be tested, we have confidence in it and we're ready to, uh, to build, we've got momentum. Anyway, that's how the design sprint process works. Map, sketch, decide, prototype and test. And uh, again, it's about sort of like building momentum with a simulation before uh, going to the trouble of launching and, and executing on a product. Uh, and uh, in 2016, I wrote this book and, and um, in 2021, as Beth mentioned, we started this venture fund, me and my co-author and uh, a friend of his who, who had some uh, finance background and who had to put together a venture fund because I don't. And so um, now we're working basically with startups. And so one of the things that I do is, is help startups uh, find product market fit with, uh, with design sprints. And I'm continuing to tweak and refine the, the process. So uh, actually kind of working on like the 2023 version of this template, uh, because um, there's, there's a lot to, lot to optimize and do here. And, and this process has spread quite a bit. So it's for started with those first teams um, that I was working with at Google, the startups we worked with directly at Google Ventures. As I wrote blog posts about it, it started to get picked up by tech companies, including lots of tech companies who hate Google. So I don't think that's why they uh, they did it. Uh, agencies and some larger, like more traditional companies. Uh, and it's starting to be uh, taught in, uh, in a few places and, and even being picked up by, you know, sort of nonprofits and governments, um, which is a lot more than I imagined when I started doing this. But uh, but it's, it's kind of cool. And I think it's because a lot of folks are looking for a way to uh, you know, to start something. It's really hard to start new things. Um, when I'm doing this as sort of a sales pitch to people, and I'm not to you, you guys can do this or not, but I say, I think it's true. I, you know, I hope you'll try this. When you find yourself in this situation that you're starting a big project, um, give it a try. The, the pitch for it is that it's a great way to assess product market fit, to waste less time, get closer to the customers. But one of the things I think is most powerful about it is that it gives you a totally reframed way to work with your team. And that like our human lives are spent 
working with, with people. A lot of our lives are at work and a lot of our lives are working with our colleagues, but a lot of it's through these stupid like intermediaries of emails and chats and, and, you know, meetings that we hate and stuff. And, and working in this way is, is kind of a really powerful experience to have with, uh, with these people who, you know, they may not be our, our like loved ones or our life partners, but we spend a lot of time with them. And so, um, you know, it matters anyway, I'll, I'll stop there. And if we have time, uh, maybe we can do some questions. Thank you so much, Jake. That's great. Um, one of the disadvantages of the Zoom is you can't get um, a room full of applause. So I'll give you my <laughs> So there we go. Um, we've got one question in the chat. Uh, I encourage um, other folks, if you have questions, go ahead, put them in the chat, or you can unmute yourself and ask. But I'm just going to share with you here Veronica's uh, question. Um, but first, I'm just going to say, I really love the idea of uh, the start, you know, in HCDE, you do a lot of work around iteration, how we close that loop from idea to feedback and the framing, you know, of focusing on that moment of starting is really compelling. So, but to Veronica's question here, she asks, uh, I was wondering, how do you see the role of a UX researcher uh, within the design, in the design sprint? Well, it, it's, uh, it's possible to run a design sprint without a researcher. It's, it, it's possible. And, you know, the, the um the format of the interview that we the interviews that we do at the end of the week is um sort of simple enough that a fool like me can run one and get some value out of it and the nature of doing design sprints which is that we typically like i said we do 2 to 3 at the beginning and so if we don't know anything about our customers at the beginning and we are taking our sort of best hunch best guess that we're getting some research, we're starting to, to synthesize, we will start to do some of the things that a researcher would do for us and over the course of the sprints. Because a lot of the startups I've worked with, they don't, they don't have that luxury of having a researcher, they may have two or three people on the team because they're just starting out. So all that is to say, it's possible to run a design sprint without a researcher, but it is much, much, much better with a researcher, with someone who, um, A, they may come into the sprint with a lot of knowledge about the customer. And so one of the things that we do in the sprint on the first day is a process called Ask the Experts, putting the spotlight on one person on the team, or sometimes a person who's not on the team who kind of comes in um, just for a cameo appearance to share their knowledge. But that's a time when a researcher can really shine and they share like, look, here's sort of the, the model as you're making this map, as you're thinking about what the key risks are, as you're thinking about what the key opportunities are, here's the things that we've already identified uh, through, through research. So that's really helpful. Uh, researchers often have really interesting approaches to sketching. So, you know, one of the ideas here is you have every single person on the team sketch. It's not just the designer or just the product manager or whatever, who, whoever might normally do it, but we want the researcher to, to sketch a solution. And we expect that they're going to have a different perspective and a different understanding of what the customers are looking for. Researchers will often sketch things that very closely mirror the thought process that customers go through or the needs or wants or questions customers have. And because of that, they, they often meet those needs really effectively. And, and then, of course, in conducting these interviews, um, where we're, what we're trying to do is, is tricky. We're trying to take a, you know, a, get as much sort of product market fit hunch as we can out of out of these these interviews it's really helpful to have someone who's skilled in framing questions in making space for people to talk and then helping to synthesize the results who knows how to sift through this is what the person said but this is the part you should actually pay attention to or knows how to ask questions so they're not leading to to one sort of response or another and also can pick up in the moment on a place to probe and get more out of it. And I mean, you know, as you're a researcher, you know the things that you're good at. Those things all really shine in a sprint. So I guess in summary, like it's possible without one and it works It works okay, but having a great researcher is really great. And working at Google Ventures, uh, we were lucky to have on the team, Michael Margolis, who's uh, actually was in uh, over in uh, the, on the east side there. He works in the Kirkland office for Google Ventures and, um, and, and helped to shape the whole process and, and how we how we build those interviews in, it really comes from that. Thanks a lot for that answer. Okay, there are now a lot of questions here. Okay, I'll yeah. try to answer faster. Um, <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, I'm gonna read some out fast. Any advice for companies trying to switch from a more waterfall, waterfall style of working to design sprints? Well, you don't actually have to switch. 
And, you know, I think waterfall people sometimes get, get kind of like they poo-poo it, but a lot of things are well, like waterfall is a great way to do some kinds of projects. You know, if you're a, um, building hardware, for example, you're going to have to have some parts where, you know, so the whole thing is not going to be able to be super agile. So, um, and also a lot of downsides to traditional agile. The thing about the design sprint is it's kind of agnostic to how you execute because you do it at the beginning. You just pause what you're doing, get the team together, do two to three design sprints. And then once you've got confidence and you say, okay, now we're switching into execute mode and that could be waterfall. That could be whatever. Like it doesn't really matter. It, it's, it's, it's going to be agnostic to the process. Thank you, Matt. I'm skipping your question. Uh, here's one. Any thoughts on working in teams, uh, how working in teams remotely affects running design sprints and any suggestions on how to run a design sprint remotely? Yes, go to the sprintbook.com slash remote. And there's a guide that um, we wrote. It's, I think I, I need to update it because this was sort of shortly after the pandemic started when I finally realized the whole thing was not gonna just blow over in uh, you know, um, two weeks to stop the spread. You guys remember that? Um, but um, but it, it actually, in there's things that you lose because being together is just better. Like there's some nice human things about being together in the same room. But running a design sprint over video, um, I have a template I use in Miro, and that template takes a lot of the stress off of me running the sprint because like, there's a lot less I have to explain or keep in my head. It creates this artifact that we have afterwards. And there's something about being in video and not being in the same room that can make the use of time a little bit more efficient. So often we're able to work, well, we kind of have to work shorter days because being over video is exhausting, but we're able to get more done in a shorter period of time. Anyway, the sprintbook.com slash remote. I'll put that into chat. Thank you. So we are officially at the end of class time. Um, if you're willing to stick around and answer more questions, sure. we can yeah. keep going. Um, but I know some of the uh, students likely have um, other obligations. Feel free to hang on. And if you have a, if you need to drop and you want to put a question in the chat, we'll get through as many as we can. Uh, okay, so um, the let's see, any criticisms that you have uh, encountered on the design sprint framework? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, let's see, try to keep us short. Um, I mean, <laughs> top, two. top two. Yeah, I think I think actually the research one is one of the big criticisms that des designers and researchers are the first to criticize it. <laughs> um, and, and I think that the, you know, one of the big criticisms people have is like, you, well, you're starting without research and that is counter to, everything everyone's ever talked about with design thinking or sort of like the the right way to do things as we go out and we like build empathy with the customer. And then only then do we start thinking about what the opportunities are. And, you know, I, my response to that is that it is just not a realistic assessment of how things happen, uh, how the products that we love get built. They, they come from an insight or an intuition that somebody has. Now, most of the insights and intuitions people have about products and features are not the right ones, you know, but the ones that work, they, they also start as intuitions. So what I want to do with the sprint is to harness that energy people already have to solve the problem, to solve the problem based on where they are at that moment. And like I said, like if they've done research, if they have it, that's great. We want that. But to say you've got to start with research. And if you do, that's where you're going to come up with the insight. I don't, I don't believe that. I, I think you, you start with where you are and a really hugely important part of this is tuning the team's intuition. And we really have to like start to see intuition, recognize it, label it and see when it's right and when it's wrong, because that's what's going to create something that works. We're going to have to have intuition that's ahead of where our customers are. We're going to have to see an opportunity that they don't see yet, that, they, that our competition doesn't see yet. And that the best way I know to do that is to lay our intuition on the line week after week after week and see what happens. And then, you know, you get those reps in and you learn, but I'm defending myself and not talking about the criticism. That's the criticism. You, you start without research and, uh, and, you know, it's just kind of the same old thing. And, you know, uh, so that's one, I think another one is, um, that the, the sample size is too small, you know, five customers, it's not, it's not statistically meaningful. And, um, I'm actually, uh, as I'm starting to talk about design sprints now lowering the threshold below five, cause I've seen teams, if they've recruited the right customers have 
success, you know, they've learned something from as few as talking to like two customers. If you talk to two customers and that's more than zero, like you're better off, especially if you're going to sprint the next week and test with another slate of customers. Mm -hmm. One of the big things that holds people back from doing research or from doing design processes or from considering alternatives is that it takes too long, you know, and, and if research takes weeks to plan and months to execute or whatever, like we're just, we're not going to do it. So we need a faster way to learn. And we need to be realistic about how the decision makers in our organizations make decisions about how things really happen. Again, I'm just defending myself, but those are two, those are, that's an example of two criticisms. But I think that's really helpful. It's, you know, it's also, it's a framework, right? No one's saying it's the only way to do things. It's just, well, I, I'd say it's the only way, but well, it, is, I, yeah. it is true. <laughs> it's also not the mode you should be in all the time right it's like it's for a very specific instant mm -hmm. and i and I, I will argue with people that like i don't even know of like a good alternative for that instant where you're just starting and like we need to get going like that one is is really kind of a the best alternative is usually chaos but it's not what you do when you're defining the product, all the stuff that comes after. There's so much design work and research to do after. Mm -hmm. There's all kinds of stuff you could do before. But in that one instant, I do think it's a, you know, I'm still waiting. Someone will come up with something better at some point and, you know, I'll, I will be happily like wave the flag. But until that point, like I'm not competing with anything, but I do think in that moment, it's probably your best bet. For that moment of the start. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's great. Uh, someone's looking for some tips of how to persuade stakeholders to do a sprint, especially at a smaller organization. It's probably good to follow like a, like good fundamental sales techniques, which is to, um, listen a lot, you know, to ask a lot of questions and find out what's the problem that they see. And then think about if you think a design sprint actually helps the problems that they see. And if so, tune your pitch to their problems. Uh, I found at Google that the problems and the pain people had in 2010 was that we had very few designers relative to the amount of engineers and the amount of stuff that Google was doing. At the same time, the iPhone had been out for a couple of years and there was a rising expectation among customers of how well-designed things should be. So we, you know, there was a, there was a gap there. And part of what I was offering was here's a way to get design on your project to, we, I can bring together a team of designers in, in this design sprint week. Cause that was part of the formula in the beginning was to have more than one designer alongside the product manager, the engineers from the team. And so the sales process was really about like the prototype in one week, we'll make you a prototype. And I find that's often still very compelling, depending on the kind of problems people identify, they may be feeling stalled and stuck. And the notion of getting to a prototype in a week could be the most compelling salient uh, outcome for them. Often a very compelling sales pitch is alignment. You have a complex organization, there's different you know, there's this group over here and this group over here, and they're going to have to agree at some point. Well, rather than one group coming up with a solution and then later on pitching it to the others, what if you get them in the room? I have a, here's a, here's a recipe for them to work together in a, in a productive way and get rowing in the same direction. Um, it is rare that the notion of getting data quickly is compelling to decision makers unless it's a startup, like unless it's a very early stage startup and they're really tuned into that idea. That's, although that's the biggest payoff to the sprint, that it's rare that people will, will respond to that pitch. Um, so I'd say my main approach would be like, listen to what's going on, what they think the problem is. And then if you think a design sprint works, tune your pitch to what they need. But the other thing to do is to go to them and say, I see this problem. I think we're wasting a lot of time and are going to waste a lot of money potentially doing the wrong thing. And I think this could be a way to help what do you think about experimenting with it? You know, what do you think about this being like an experiment that we run and then we evaluate whether it worked? And I don't just mean an experiment like the design sprint ends with a kind of experiment and test. I mean, the process itself is an experiment and we'll, we'll you know, most times when we change like, oh, now we're gonna, we're gonna switch from waterfall to, you know, scrum or whatever, it's this big massive switch and now we can never go back. The design sprint, it's like, well, we could try it for two weeks and then see how it goes and see if we ever wanna do it again or not. And then you're not, you know, you're not throwing your life on the line over it. Um, just see if it works. Perfect. Uh, a couple. Let's um, let's try to wrap this up at twelve thirty. How's that? One more. One more quick question. Okay. Um, a few people are really interested in this idea of having the decider. Um, 
any tips on who makes for an ideal decider? Is it like around job title or anything around that? Yeah, it, it, it needs to be the real decider. That's kind of the most key thing. And so it depends um, who's in the room. It no, you got to shape the team. Actually, you've got to get that person who is the real decider involved. And uh, sometimes on teams, it's really clear. Oh, you know what? The this person, this role, they have the authority to make decisions about what we launch. And great, they're on the team right here. Perfect. You know, if you're doing a sprint with a startup and they have five people and one's the CEO, okay, great. It's the CEO. You, you know, she's going to make all the calls. No problem. But in a lot of teams, in a bigger organization, it's not always so clear who makes a decision. And so the first thing you do before you even sprint is figure out who actually makes a decision. There is somebody, at some point, there's somebody who like, we're going to have to sell this to or pitch to or whatever. Well, that person either needs to be in the sprint the whole time, but sometimes that's not reasonable. So if they can't be, they need to be there for this, this like key moment, which is when you've got all the sketches up, we've reviewed them all. Now we're going to decide which one to go with. And if you have the sprint book, there's a story about Slack and their CEO coming in just at that moment and making the decision. You can kind of see how that works. But the, um, you know, if, if that's the case, you have a CEO who's going to make, or not necessarily a CEO, but like a decider, a big boss. I usually say it's like the big boss is going to come in for a cameo. Then you're still going to need a decider in the room for all of the other decisions along the way. And mm -hmm. it's best if the big boss like deputizes someone and says like, this is a person who I'd like to be in the room making the decisions and I'll come in and make that one big decision. Um, but if you, you know, that's ideal. It may just be that you know on your team, like, yeah, it's naturally this person is our design lead or it's our product manager. Um, that person often makes a good decider for along the way. Importantly, if the big boss won't make a half an hour to come in and make a decision about this, what should be like a big project that's just starting off, should be a great moment, a great use of their time. If the big boss won't come in, don't run a design sprint on it. And question why you're working on the project, because um, that's, a, that's a big red flag. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. So we're at 1231. There's still some more questions. Um, I I don't mind hanging out and asking answering more questions, but All right. I also, well, you guys take, may have to leave. It could just be me on here. Let's take myself. one more question, then I have a question for you. <laughs> okay. Uh, but uh, a question about uh, different cultural context. So have you used the Sprint framework uh, working with teams in different contexts? And if so, any feedback on how to adapt or any limitations you faced? Yeah. I mean, I think that the, I have, I have run sprints in different contexts. I doubt that they are come close to representing the spectrum of cultural context that one could run them in, but, you know, a startup's culture is very different from a big company's culture. A tech company's culture may be very different from like a you know a traditional sort of corporation's culture. Uh, like a government working with like a city government is is very different from those. The most striking thing going from different from context to context to context, and I've run sprints you know in in different countries and not in a lot of different countries, but you know you see different you see some different things there. You see different things in Scandinavia, for example, with the way people like they they really like to have a consensus. It's really hard for them to to not go around the room and hear from everybody talking about it and then talk until they have consensus about it. And I mean that's a stereotype, but like that it's it's the way companies typically typically run so it's it's you know that's a challenge there so there there may be a unique challenge in different contexts the the most striking thing is that fundamentally the sort of problem solving framework works really well across cultures so it's mm -hmm. it like it it addresses a lot of fundamental things people need and when i first started doing the design sprints at google my thought was well this could work for at google i was really just trying to think of something at google for our products that face like sort of everyday consumer situations, not like expert users, you know, not like people who are creating ad campaigns and it's really sophisticated and they're very, they're very sophisticated. It's a very sophisticated tool for them. I was just thinking like, oh, you're doing know, casual, like you use Gmail or use Google search. That's something people can wrap their heads around in a week on the team and come up with a reasonable prototype. But it turned out, like it has turned out over time that it's it it works in many more environments than I thought. And I think it's because fundamentally we're 
what we're doing is just in the at the beginning laying out what are sort of the parameters of this problem space what do we know about it mm -hmm. and then we're saying what are different solutions potential solutions to this problem and then we're saying well, which of those are the strongest worth investigating and then we're kind of testing those and that and the way i just said it it's just like a very simplistic way to like approach a problem and and you know it's it's kind of the same way I approached when my car got stuck in the driveway when it snowed. Like, it, okay, like I try the first solution. Well, what are the different things we could do? Like, it's just a, it's pretty basic. And so the basics work, but there are, there are always going to be like some tunings. And I think a lot of the tuning has, like it works when, um, when as a, as a facilitator or like a sprint leader person running it, I'm um, uh, sort of, sympathetic to people's skepticism or reluctance to do things in this different way. And I, I try to anticipate what their objections are and explain why here's why we're doing this step in this way. Um, and, and yeah, I know it feels weird. Like it feels weird to me too, to do this. Here's, here's why I think it's worth doing in this way. Um, and, and in my experience has usually helped. So is there, is there anything that that you've noticed when you get away from working on, like with a team working on, say, an app or something digital versus, say, a physical product? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, like the fundamentals are still kind of the same. Like we have to think about who is this for and, and who's the most important of the people who it's for, like the most crucial for us to learn about. And what's the most important moment that they have with this where we can we can learn the most and answer the most of our questions. Um, so a lot of the like you basically think of it as like days one, two, and three, like map, sketch, decide, that's kind of the same. What's different is what is our prototype going to look like and what is the test going to look like? And so for a, you know, physical object, it may be that we're, like, there's one example, and as I try to tell this kind of fast, but there's one example where like we we're testing a, a wearable medical device. And, um, and so the, the testing the object itself is really important, but it's also important that, you know, part of their questions are what will happen when, when doctor, if doctors prescribe it, but then the patient gets the device at home, can they put it on and configure it? And it's basically a wristband for treating this one particular, um, this particular disease. And so the, the, the test ends up being, and the prototype ends up being like the the sort of script for the doctor and kind of the brochure because that's the way a lot of stuff happens in doctor's offices you know you get a brochure about this procedure you're going to have or this this device you might use and and so one person from the team sort of plays the role of the doctor and gives the brochure to the person and then just kind of watch how they you know interact with it and questions they have and then you sort of leave and say like okay like now you get this box you're at home and then you kind of walk out of the room and see can the person open the box and with like a 3d printed mock-up of the thing can they can they get it on can they you know can they look at the quick start guide and sort of make sense of it and then the last set of questions is done with like a prototype that's sort of their working prototype that doesn't physically look like the finished thing will look and is kind of kludgy but has this other, you know, it's able to answer some other questions. So then you give them that and you see if, can they configure it with the buttons on there? And does it make sense how it works? It's often a thing like that, where you're like, well, what's the question we have and what will be the form of prototype we can create and the form of like test we can create that'll help us answer those questions. And in advance, I, I usually don't know what it's going to look like, but teams who are in those spaces they can, you know, they can be inventive and figure out, okay, here's how we're going to create a prototype in a day. Here's what a test is going to look like. For some kinds of tests, your second test, like if you want to change the procedure for how a team makes decisions on hiring or how they do performance reviews or something. And these are things people have done sprints on. Your first test might be showing experts from the team or people on the team, like, here's this new process. What do you think? And maybe it's a one day thing. But the second test might be, we're going to try this for a quarter. You know, and, and it's going to be an experiment with this one team for a quarter, and then we're going to see how it goes. Um, you may not, it may be longitudinal, may not be something that you can do in a day, but there's usually something you can learn at first in a day. Thank you. I love that sort of framing around knowing what's the question you're trying to get answered and then figuring out. What yeah, kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. All right. Well, um, so the last question that I have for you, there are okay. other questions, but I'm going to seize the floor here. <laughs> At the beginning, you were talking about your time at UW and there was no HCI program or anything that, you know, would have been the right 
program for you to study given your interest in technology. So my question is what department or program does the UW not have today that we should, that 10 years from now, someone's beginning to be giving a talk and saying, well, there was no program called X, so I couldn't learn about the things that I really wanted to push mm. for. This is an interesting question, and I I don't feel like I know enough about what programs exist. So I might say something that already 100% exists, or it could be what you guys do. But you know, I think that I would have loved to have learned how to do the things that I did in the first few years of my career to, you know, to not have gone in on the job and been like not known anything. Um, although at the same time, I think there's a benefit to not knowing what you're doing in that you, I was continually looking at things with fresh eyes and trying to like scramble. And I think that that can help. I think in the long run, in the short run, that was, that made things very difficult for me, but it, it helped me in the long run. Um, the thing that I think is so powerful for, for people to have that, that um, that I, I think makes for a great program, and I think this may already exist, is to to go through the experience of starting a company and trying to find product market fit for a thing, and trying to to do it in a timeline where you have you know like we have limited resources and you've got to get it done. You know you know you've got to get it done, and you've got like you. It's not an abstract thing. The customer is truly the customer. The customer isn't a client. The customer isn't your teammates. You, you're really trying to like solve a, a business problem because so fundamentally, so many things that we do, even if they're outside of the, the world of business, they do come down to this. Does the person care in the end about what we're doing? And that, you know, is, is there value in that offering? And that's something that took me so long to get to. I came into it so you know, backwards and by accident. And now I think like, gosh, that's really at the crux of so much of what we're doing is that, that understanding of, of make, making something that, that people care about and, and kind of being on the line to do it. So I think, I think a program that was just from, I just, I would love my son is, you know, uh, like applying to colleges and we'll, we'll go next year. And I, I wish that he could just go and like, have some, a lot of guidance and structure and like peers around that experience of, starting a business and, and doing it. Uh, I think that's, that's a, that's a real key. Well, we can, we can follow up on that. I have. Cool. Ideas. Okay. Okay. So, super. <laughs> listen, um, so many students thanking you here in the chat. I hope you have time to take a look. Uh, really appreciate you staying 20 minutes over to answer all these great questions. Uh, terrific presentation. A couple students, at least one student had read your book apparently in a class last quarter. Oh, cool. I don't know which one. So that, but that's, that's fun. Awesome. Uh, anyway, thank you so much for sharing your time with us. Really appreciate it. And uh, next time you're in Seattle, Julie and I would love to take you to lunch. Yes, it's a, it's a plan. It's a plan. I'm excited. My yeah, absolute thanks, pleasure. Jake. And yeah, thank you, you Matt, any... for the connection. Yeah, too. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if you guys have any follow up questions, uh, folks on the chat or in the um, in the, if you want to share this afterwards, I'm going to put my um, email in the chat. And I'm very slow on email, but uh, I will try to answer any questions that people have um, once I once I get once I find it. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic! Thanks, Thanks you for your generosity. Yeah. Like, it's really Thank great you to so have much. You. Thank you. Have a great Thanks day. Um, for those of you, uh, the students in the class, um, reach out to Julie and I with any questions.